Good morning. Jesus has come, and he's come to give us life. He's come to give us freedom, forgiveness, and he's come to give us rest. We're going to look at rest today, and before we do that, let's pray. Father, we thank you for Christ. We thank you that he has come. We thank you that uh, he has come to save us, to save us from our shameful sins, to save us from our guilt, to save us from those things that destroy us, imprison us. Thank you he's come to save us from our fear, from our anxiety, from the stress of life. He's come to give us a new way of life, a new way of living. I pray we discover that together today in Christ's name. Amen. We got the call. Wednesday. Actually, Grandma got the call. And the call was from my son, Nathan. And he said to his mother, Mom, I think Gabby's about ready to have a baby, but I'll call you back if it's really going to be true. <laughs> Five minutes later, Kitty got another call. Mom, I think, I think Gabby's going to have a baby. Then I got the call. And when grandma calls, you go. And she said, we're going. And I was in a meeting. And I said, I got to go. I got the call. And we packed our stuff. We threw it in a big suitcase. I don't know what we did. We were just like new parents. Just <sighs> put it in our car and left for Chicago. And we were talking. We said, well... New mom, probably eight or nine hours, and the baby will be born. Well, pictures started to arrive of our grandson, Jude, when we hit 680, headed toward 80. If you know where I'm at, off 29, 680. And it's interesting, my son Nathan said, you know that prenatal class really messed me up. He said, why did I ever take that class? Because they said, when your wife goes into labor, it's a marathon, not a sprint. Well, little did they, they know that my daughter-in-law is a sprinter. Because that baby came two hours later. And we were able to visit. Sorry. welcome our fourth grandson into the world. You know, when the call comes, you leave everything. And when God calls, you leave everything. You leave work. You leave your spouse. You leave your family. And you go. When God calls, don't mess around. When God has a calling on your life, and he says you go, you get in the car, and you get on I-80. I don't care if it's snowing, sleet, 20 below zero. You go. Because the call has been given. And our response as believers is to say, yes, I will go. Yes, whatever you want from me. Yes, I'm in the car, and I'm heading. You know, there's another baby who gave a call. And that baby was named Jesus. And that baby grew up. And a young man at age 30, he gave the greatest invitation ever given to anyone here. And this invitation is found in Matthew chapter 11, verse 28. And my dream for you today is that you will leave everything today and you will follow the call of Jesus on your life. It's called the greatest invitation ever given, Matthew eleven twenty eight. 28. You'll turn there with me. First of all, we see the call. 
Jesus says, come to me. And so who is this one who says, come to me? His name's Jesus. What do we know about Jesus? Jesus is God. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was? The Word not was a God, one of many gods. The Word was God. End the story. We're not talking about Jesus and this God and that God and this idol and this God. We're talking about one God. And that one God is Jesus. And he and the Word became flesh. We just saw it on the screen. The Word became flesh and what? Dwelt among us. Who is that whom John speaks? It is Jesus. Jesus is giving the call. You don't mess with Jesus because he is king of kings. He is Lord of lords. He is our redeemer. He is our forgiver. He is the one who justifies us. He is the one who died for us. He is our atonement. He is our hope. He is the eternal one. He has no beginning. He has no end. He is the Lord of lords, and he is calling you today and I hope that you respond like Kitty and I did and just throw your stuff in the suitcase because nothing else matters. It's a get to that baby. And so Jesus is the one who makes this call. He is the creator. How can you say no to your creator? How can you say no to this man Jesus who who, who gave his all to you, who loves you, who cares for you, who challenges you, who wants to change you, who wants to do something miraculous in your life this very day. How can you sit there and say no to him? What is your excuse? When you get to heaven, are you face God in his great white throne judgment seat? I hope you don't. I hope I hope none of us see that. And God says, you know, I had a call on your life. I was calling you to myself. I was calling you to come to me. Come to me. Didn't you hear the call? What was going on in your life that you said no to me? Why did you say no? What are you going to say? Oh, I was too busy. Oh, I had too many sins. Oh, I, 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 just, I, I just felt like I could do life on my own and I really didn't need you, Jesus. What are you going to say to him? When the invitation has been given, how could you say no? You know, when I was in Cranbrook in Canada pastoring, there was a man in our church who started a retreat. And... Uh, Start off small, but within a few years, he was having 900, 1,800 on a weekend in November. And part of the draw of this retreat was, uh, well, he got some great speakers, in, uh, some of the best speakers in North America to come to this retreat. But the greatest draw to this retreat, I hate to say this, was where it was held at. It was held in Chateau Lake Louise and out of sight of Banff. Now, Chateau Lake Louise is one of the world-class hotels in all the world. People travel from all over the world to see this hotel that sits up in the mountains overlooking Lake Louise, one of the great scenes ever seen by mankind. It's just an awesome place. And so this uh, Chateau Lake Louise, he would get a deal on because it was right before ski season and right after the fall season, so he knew where to do this. So uh, one of the things he did was, uh, he said to me, Tom, he said, um, I will sponsor uh, totally free anyone 
that you invite to go to this weekend to Chateau Lake Louise, which has the greatest food. I didn't mention that food. Oh, man, the food there was just out of this world. The greatest chefs would come and cook there, right outside of uh, Jasper and Banff in that area. And he said to me, Tom, I want you to go, and I'll pay for it. Don't worry about money. And uh, you get a list, and, and anyone who, who needs a touch from Christ, from God, or, you know, Tom, I don't even care if they go to the speaking times. You just invite them to a free weekend at Chateau Lake Louise. All expenses are paid. Everything. Gratuity. You can go to any of the restaurants in there. And uh, you could ski or whatever you want to do. I said, great. So I'd make a list every year of people that uh, I thought could go and might want to touch from Jesus. And You know what amazed me about that? How many people said no to me to a free weekend at this amazing resort? I was always amazed. And their excuses, because they knew it was Christian. Well, you know, I got to do my laundry. Oh, really? Well, I got to get my hair done, you know. Or I got this, or I got that. I was always amazed. But you know what amazes me even more? I'm so amazed, after all these years in ministry, how many people say no to Jesus. And the greatest invitation at all far surpasses Chateau Lake Louise. How many people simply say no to Jesus? I can't comprehend it. I cannot understand it. I have no idea how people think, how they can deny the Savior, how they can say no to Jesus when in America we have every form, every way possible to hear this gospel message. It is presented over and over and over and over and over in our great country and people by the millions, millions say no. I don't want it. I just, I can't comprehend that. I'm always amazed. No. No. I don't want to go to Jesus. I hope that's not you. I hope and pray that's not any of us here today. And I hope and pray it's none of our family. I hope and pray that all my grandsons will all say yes to Jesus. All my family will say yes to Jesus. All my friends will say yes to Jesus. All those in this church, in my church here, will say yes to Jesus. Come to me. He doesn't say, now come and go to, you know, you go to your pastor, which is a good thing most of the time. Or go to your priest, or go to this, or go to that person, or go to a conference, or go here. Jesus directs us to come to me directly. Come to God directly. The invitation is given. The call is given. But we also have the requirement. Only those who are burdened and weary will go to Jesus. All you who are weary and burdened. That's who he's talking about. And if you're weary and burdened, you make the qualification to come. This weariness, the weariness of this, this word means to be exhausted, to work, to labor, belabor something, to work till you drop. He's not talking about physical work. He's talking about inner work, the soul, the mind that's working, that's carrying, that's trying to figure out life, 
trying to figure out purpose, trying to figure out the call upon their life, they're trying to figure out family life, trying to figure out personal life, trying to figure out work life, trying to figure out your spiritual life, trying to, try, and you're just, you're just exhausted, trying to please God, trying to do all these things, trying to, to make yourself, you know, free before God. He says, all you are weary, you're just weary, you're just tired. And burden. And that's more of a passive part of this. Weariness is the activity of your life that's wearing you out. The burden that you carry, the burden of family, the burden of kids, the burden of work and finances and health and, and spiritual life, your growth and all these things that surround you. And you just take them. It's like uh, you're carrying a backpack and brick after brick is loaded upon you. And you're tired. Well, good news. You meet the qualification to go to Jesus. Now, if you don't feel that way, you'll never go. If you don't feel weary, if you don't feel burdened, and you don't, nothing's a big deal to you. Sin's not a big deal to you. Guilt is not a big deal to you. Whatever it is before God, that's not a big deal. You don't have to think about that. If all, if nothing is, is, a, is burdensome and weary and you can handle life yourself, well, this sermon is really boring. And you've checked out a long time ago. You say, hey, I got it handled. I can do this myself. I don't need, I don't need Jesus. I don't need church. I don't need community. I don't need fellowship. I don't need Bible study. I don't need to read the Bible. I don't need to pray. I got it all figured out. I can do this on my own. Well, you don't meet the qualification if you are weary and burdened, the invitation is for you. And then we have the promise. And I will give you rest. He's going to give you rest. Inner rest. Rest of your mind. Rest of your heart. Rest of your soul. Because your burdens you're going to put at the feet of Jesus every day. Every day you're going to learn to live a whole new way. Every day you're going to say, okay, God, I, I know my sin. I, I know that my attitude's not right. I know that I have not treated people in a loving way. I know, I, I know that I have failed here. But you know, Jesus, I just come to you and I, and I give you these sins. I can't carry them anymore. They're yours. I don't want to take them back. You take them. And Jesus, I have a burden. I'm concerned about my family. I'm concerned about my marriage. I'm concerned about my finances. I'm concerned about my health. Lord, I just give them to you. You can have them. <clears throat> you can handle them. And Lord, I got other things. I got fears in my life. I've got anxiety issues. And God, I can't do it anymore. And you go to Jesus like that, and you will find rest each day for your soul. And my prayer is that that would be yours today, that you would have rest. A little while ago, I read a biography of Thomas Kincaid. Anyone know who Thomas Kincaid is? Raise your hands. Wow. You all got pictures of him. You know, you made him a very wealthy man. Thomas Kincaid painted the most restful and peaceful pictures I've ever seen. My own mother, she's not really into art, she loved Thomas Kincaid pictures. And uh, he had uh, 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 these wonderful scenes of nature and churches and snow and sleigh bells and, and you'd walk into a Thomas Kincaid 
uh, store and rest would just come over you. He was a very, very powerful artist. But his personal life was nowhere near what his pictures had. His personal life was a mess. Oh, he was a wealthy man. We all made him wealthy. One few years that he was really selling, he made $53 million. In fact, they call him the billion dollar artist. And he had a marketing strategy and he had so much going on and he had sellers. And... But his life was a mess. It, was, it looked good. His pictures looked great. But he left his wife, left his kids, became an alcoholic, and died a lonely, bankrupt, broke, no money. He lost it all. Died in some apartment alone because of the mix of alcohol and the drugs he was taking. He had no rest in his soul. It looked good, just like his pictures. But the man behind the picture was in great inner turmoil. And some of you have a picture of rest and togetherness and calmness. But inside, you're dying. You're dying. And you know it. No one else knows it, but you know it. And you need rest for your soul. You need Jesus. You need him. I'd like us to bow our heads and just ask this one Jesus to come and to give you rest. He can do that. Why don't you receive him today? Ask him into your life. Ask him to come and to give you rest for your soul. Augustine said, our souls are restless till they find thy rest in thee. Until you find Jesus, there will be no rest. Father, as we look to you, I pray, Father, as uh, we uh, bring this message to a close. I pray that the words of Jesus would strike us, would cause us to come to you and lay our burdens down at your feet, to lay our weariness, to lay our sins, our guilt, our shame at the feet of Jesus. How I pray, Lord, that uh, inside of us, in the inner man, there would be peace and rest. Thank you for this time together. We bless your name. In Christ's name, amen. We're going to hear the choir sing if they would come forward. Haven't we had a wonderful time with our choir? Let's give them a hand as they come forward. It's just been awesome. This is our best choir we've ever had. Yes. And uh, they're going to sing some, uh, I think, Handel, right? And who else, are, who else is on the docket? The two selections from Handel's Messiah and one from Vivaldi's Gloria. Wow. Now that's going to be quite a challenge, but uh, I think you'll enjoy it. So uh, it's great to have you here today, and we're going to hear from our choir right now. The first time music is really mentioned in the Bible is in Genesis 4 when they talk about Jubal who is the, the father of all who play the flute and the harp. And throughout all the ages, composers of varying skill levels, 
of varying styles of music have used music to glorify God, from anything from a, a simple spiritual that repeats the same words over and over, which somewhat like modern music worship, modern, uh, worship music sometimes, to very, very complex oratorios that were written during the Baroque and some of the major classical periods. All of those different kinds of music do the same thing. They express our, our amazement at God, we express our uh, worship of Him, and it can be done in so many different ways. This morning we're going to do something that's a little bit different than what we traditionally do with the adult choir at Christmas time. Normally we do things that are a little bit more in a contemporary vein, but this morning we are going to share with you some songs that have been used to glorify God for somewhere around 275 years. As we mentioned before, the first two selections are from Handel's Messiah, which is a, a wonderful piece written by Handel to ex express the life of Jesus, which I'm sure you've all heard of. And the second is a short selection from Vivaldi's Gloria. And we hope this morning that that is a blessing to you as we realize there are very, very many different styles of music that we can use to worship God with.
Thank you. Boy, I can hear some more of that. That was awesome. Let's stand together and pray a prayer benediction before you go. Pray over our food. You're invited to our lunch. Love to have you. I hope everyone goes. It's all ready for you. Also, Christmas Eve service, 6 o'clock. Then Sunday morning, we have a 10 a.m. service, but they're the same services. Now, you want to go to the same service, both of them, you can, or you can choose. You can come Christmas Eve, or you can come Sunday morning. It's great to have you here. Lord, wow, we truly praise your name. We are filled with joy because of Christ. Our hearts soar to you. And we're so thankful for Jesus. May he live this week with us as we come back together for Christmas Eve or the Christmas Day service. May we truly bow and honor him and worship him as the true and living God. Lord, as we go, I pray that you would strengthen us, give us the joy of Jesus today, in your name, amen. amen. Shake someone's hand, say Merry Christmas, and uh, we have lunch ready to go right now, and love to have you for it. <laughs>